Great. Um, well, welcome uh, to the Union Square video projection series uh, panel conversation. Um, today we have three featured artists, Angie Lynn Boyer, Allison Tannenhaus, and Margaret Wiss. And um, basically we had a three and a half month projection series. It was a three part series um, where we projected video art onto a building facade in Union Square, Somerville. And um, it was broken up into three themes. And we have an artist um, from each of those themes. Um, so from story and animation or storytelling, we have Angie Lynn Boyer. Um, she is an artist uh working in photography moving image light and fiber and additionally she leads brand and creative marketing at tulip interfaces in abstraction we have allison tannenhaus um, she's a digital glitch artist who specializes in abstract geometries kaleidoscopic color fields trippy op art mind-bending motion and unexpected dimensional qualities and from the dance Theme. We have Margaret Wiss. She is a choreographer, educator, and performer, um, as well as many other disciplines. And she's keenly interested in the interaction between dance and science. Um, I'd like to thank the Somerville Arts Council who funded and produced this video projection series, um, as well as special thanks to Somerville Media Center, Dave Ortega, Greg Jenkins, Aritza, and Bob Raymond and the Mobius Artist Group. Um, uh, Bob Raymond and Mobius Artist Group created the original um, projection setup on the roof. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, just, uh, just to Give an introduction. Um, if everyone could say hello, um, maybe Angie first, if you could just say hello to everyone. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. And how about Allison? Hi, happy to be here as well. And how about Margaret? Hi, all. My name is Margaret. Happy to also be here. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the way this panel is set up is I'm, I'm going to share um, a video or two um, that each artist um, actually had projected on the building facade and ask them a few questions about the video. And then I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll, we'll just jump into a panel discussion and learn more about um, each of the artists. Um, so we'll we'll go in the same order that the projection series uh, was uh, set up, um, which is storytelling, abstraction, and then dance. Um, so first we have uh, storytelling or story and animation um, with Angie Lynn Boyer. Um, so I'm just going to play her piece and um, ask her a few questions and we'll just let it play at times as well. So you can uh, watch the video in case you didn't see it live. Um, Angie, could you tell us a little bit about your inspiration for this video? Sure. So this video was originally made for a show that was produced by my friend, Julia. I knew that it was going to be projected, funnily enough, in kind of like a, a basement club um, on a bed sheet, which was kind of the basis for what was to become this project. Um, and at the time, I was really inspired by, I guess, really mundane internet things. So things like 
stock images and the notes app on my iPad and the, um, the Yosemite desktop background. Um, and then also all of this found footage on my iPhone, um, just from taking videos of things that I found poetic. So I really wanted to see how I could take all these things and put them together. Um, also really interested in how words and images work together. Um, so wanted to take these images and, and put them together into something that felt um, maybe a little bit more see-through than we usually see them, um, like layering a lot of like translucent images on top of each other um, and weaving them together. Um, how did how did it look on the bed sheet? It was so cool. I keep trying to reproduce it. Um, I had so I had a friend holding up each of the top corners, and during the course of the show, they would be um, like waving their arms up and down, so it would ripple um, along with all of the images on the screen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so in abstraction, we have Allison Tannenhaus. Um, and, oh yeah, just to let you know, I, I don't have any sound on any of the videos. Um, we didn't, we didn't have sound in the, uh, projection series. So I wanted to keep it the same, although I know many of you have uh, sound in your original as composed videos. Um, Allison, would you mind telling us a little bit about this piece? Sure. Um, so this was a collaboration with another Somerville artist, uh, Doug Bielmeyer. He made a very cool instrumental track um, and he kind of had this idea about um, corporate responsibilities, so kind of like this uh, tension between like big business having these kind of like outreach uh, efforts to help their communities, but also like how much of that is really compensating for financial harm they've done, but then also kind of looking at us being complicit in it in terms of like we're, oh, how perfect, we're part of the machine. Um, so uh, for this piece, I grabbed a lot of um, public domain footage, mostly like mid-century, um, looked up stuff like capitalism and banking and shopping and tried to, try to kind of contrast um, like the, I think sort of earnest optimism of that time about like the future of commerce and technology um, and then applied a ton of my glitchy effects to kind of bring a little bit of a, kind of in a weird way, a sinister quality, even though it's all very colorful, um, but at the same time, sort of tongue in cheek, um, sort of this like my love of kitsch um, and uh, graphics and charts. Um, so kind of just like embracing the, I don't know, just, just the energy um, and the optimism of that time with kind of like a, a wry look at like, how it's all transpired um and there's a lot of there's different sections and this part is kind of like the like the office kind of uh industrial section then there's some stuff that's like more ecological and environmental and then it kind of by the end gets like sort of more like nuclear um so uh so that's what's going on here is uh and there was a clip that we just saw the um uh these dollar signs have me seeing dollar signs is some word art that I made that's kind of harkens to my very first uh, kind of glitch in experimental works with typography. So I, I snuck that in there, but most of the other clips in here um, are legit uh, antiques. 
Um, but I sort of wanted to play around with um, injecting some of my own voice in addition to manipulating found footage. And then of course, the way that it's edited together, if you watch the full video with the sound, it brings another dimension, but um, it totally works as a projection because it's it, even more so maybe because it's just like all that more disorienting and just like overpowering and it's seemingly uh, without the, I kind of like how without a, um, an explanation, you still get it, but it's maybe not as hitting you over the head, but like, that's okay. Cause we didn't want to be uh, too preachy about it. It's sort of more about like the gestalt and just absorbing it in your own way. So yeah, this is the kind of acid tinged uh, beach pollution uh, time. And actually in a lot of the, this is actually like, it looks like it's oil, but this is all footage of water. Um, so I just applied a bunch of effects to kind of even the more benign elements. So this is oil, <laughs> even the more benign elements, I was sort of able to give um, this, yeah, this tinge of, um, unease um well maybe not a tinge maybe it's over the top but that's okay that's that's how I like making my art is kind of over the top so so yeah so we went back and forth and um sort of figured out the sections and he had some really good feedback um and I mean I can talk more about collaborations maybe later on um but that's definitely like a key part of my practice is teaming up with different disciplines different artists um who give me inspiration opportunities um, and just kind of like push me to think in, think in new ways and try new techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any clip in here that I have not messed up in some way intentionally. Um, so yeah, I'm like, wow, this all looks really weird. It's like, oh yeah, that's that's what my art looks like. <laughs> so <laughs> and kind of cool also having it be an open air thing when there is so much of this stuff that's um so much of the footage is outdoors. Like someone's driving by and they look up and they see a car driving. Um, so I think it wasn't made to be site specific, but I think it works really well with the sky and there's all these natural elements and then sort of like more built industrial things. I think um, I think it was a, a really excellent choice um, in terms of the context. Yeah. So yes, ending on a happy note of this. This is like the, the future looking, which like I think is really pretty, but is also like totally garish. And in conjunction with the music, it also gets like really amped up and uh, yeah, kind of fatalistic. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, so next up, we have Margaret Wiss, um, uh, who created this with Mike Brim, um, by side by. Uh, Margaret, could you tell us a little bit about this work? Sure. Um, so this work was made um, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, right? Um, at the start of March, um, Mike and I began working together kind of right at March and we were planning to make this piece actually for the stage. So our first initial conversations were more for a stage work that was to be presented in May. Um, but then we kind of, we were both in New York City at the time, and then we kind of dispersed and I came back to Massachusetts and he went to Maine. And so we were collaborating um, remotely, um, creating this piece. Um, and so lots of things changed. Um, for me as a dance artist, I was 
I was taking Zoom technique classes and those weren't very fulfilling. Um, and so I kind of started this practice outside um, in an open farm field, which I've been going to daily and documenting, um, which you can see in the second part of this video is kind of like a chunk of 30 days. Um, but I was trying to find kind of what brought me joy in movement because taking technique classes in my bedroom, like on a screen was just not very fulfilling and satisfying. So kind of getting outdoors and nature and kind of being with the changing of the seasons, um, what motivated the kind of development of the piece. Um, we were definitely talking a lot about time and not being um, side by side, um, hence the title by side by. Um, and also kind of the directionality and the unknown of this time. Um, Mike's music uh, is written for four pianos and some of the titles are northward and southward and we have a compass, the different compass in there and where we are in this time um, is very like unclear. Um, and just kind of figuring that out. Um, one of our initial conversations I had told him, I was like, we should just do it for all the entire four seasons. Um, and that was not, we had to create something for the deadline in May, um, but um, I've been continuing to do the practice ever since. And so March uh, 21st will be my one year <laughs> anniversary of doing this kind of um, study every single day. So what you're seeing now is daily different, um, me going out to the field and documenting. Yeah. Um, and did I hear you correctly? Did you say four, four pianos? Yes, it's written for four hands on the piano, um, but he all played, it played all of them and layered them. Yeah. I hope um, so. Could, um, could you talk a little bit about maybe the passage of time and um, I don't know how, how it feels to you watching it or kind of creating it? Um, yeah, I mean, initially we had these four different sections. They kind of just arose. Um, and we also kind of wanted to have them just in different um, whatever you wherever you were in the world, you would see them in a different order, um, which is not time related, but um, it was kind of this ambiguous feeling. Um, and yeah, that didn't answer your question. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that's, that's fine. I, I never expect um, any particular answer. <laughs> It's definitely weird to watch it now. It feels um, very soothing almost to me in a sense to watch this because this time definitely for both of us, we were both finishing our masters. Um, it was definitely a big of a shock um, in kind of going our separate ways. Um, and so looking back on this time, I've definitely blocked a lot of it out of my memory in just kind of getting through it and producing a thesis and all that stuff. So it's definitely nice to look at this, um, but it also makes me hopeful just because of the angle of the sky, which was not intentional at all. It was just me in a field and that's the way I could put it, my phone on the ground. <laughs> so, um, but yeah. Um, awesome. Well, I think um, this video is a little bit longer than the other one, so um, I'll let it play, but I'll, I'll open up the questions um, to everyone. Um, or, or maybe we'll try going in order again. Um, so I was thinking um, about where you find your inspiration in your creative process and in your art. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Angie, you wanted to uh, speak to that at all. 
Sure, I'm happy to. So um, a lot of the inspiration that I find honestly is, um, and I alluded to this when I was talking about my, my piece that was projected, but just like really mundane objects. So I, I really like stock photos, commercial art, product photos, um, things that are created to, to look a certain way and to try to like sell a certain thing in, in, in such a way that has become just like so normalized to us. Um, and some other artists um, that I really admire um, in terms of like video, Don Hertzfeldt is a really big inspiration for me. Um, he is an animator who layers um, all different types of footage uh, really, really well. So I would um, it, also in a very narrative way, um, I would definitely recommend checking out his work if you're interested. Awesome. Um, Allison, do you have any thoughts on inspiration? So I'm like super bad at coming up with names and things off the top of my head. Um, so in terms of inspiration, I was kind of, when I was preparing that um, for this, it was sort of more thinking like, sort of more just like the source material that I'm working with. Um, uh, like Angelina, I like working with like pop culture stuff or with um, existing material. So, and just to kind of give a little bit of an explanation in terms of like how I create my work, um, I take um, existing photos and art, like vintage artifacts. A lot of it's my own photos or my own footage, then public domain stuff. And then I run it through a bunch of different apps on my phone to manipulate it, animate it. Sometimes I'll do it kind of like daisy chained where you'll start with one uh, but a source footage, and then I'll run it through like three different apps. So everything kind of gets really abstracted and distorted and removed from its source at times, or like with the video you showed where there's still some recognizability. So um, the inspiration kind of comes from the source material and like what I think I can do with it. And then part of it is just like the serendipity of embracing error and being inspired by what the technology is able to do or what mistakes are able to generate um, in terms of like happy accidents. So it's a kind of a mix of experimentation and intention. So I think uh, the inspiration kind of comes from just like embracing that process um, and chance. And then another side of inspiration is just like the people I'm lucky enough to collaborate with, whether they're musicians or installation artists or other visual artists um, and, you know, like with the Doug piece, like what his overarching idea was um, really sparked something in me um, and what I would be able to do in terms of like, in, you know, in a way storytelling while not being traditional. Um, so I think that kind of answered your question. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess same question to you, Margaret, in terms of your inspiration. Sure. Um, when I'm creating uh, more stage work, um, it's more of, I mean, I guess it's, it's both. Um, I'm very interested in the history of places and what space that I am creating in. A lot of my stage work normally happens. I create outside, create some material there of kind of like uh, more pedestrian of what happens in this space and then take it into the theater and make that even more site specific in its own sense. Um, also very interested in science. I have a degree in dance kinesiology. Um, so kind of the science of movement, but also just kind of being very curious about why we do things and reading a lot on just why. Um, uh, but also collaboration is a big inspiration for me. Um, all Anyone who I work with, either dancers, musicians, places, I think of them as my collaborators and what I can learn um, from their kind of uh, response to what we're creating together. Um, yeah. Awesome. And um, yeah, on the topic of collaboration, I know, um, Allison, you talked about collaboration. Um, do you want to comment on how that informs your process or why, why you do it? What what excites you about collaborations? Sure. Um, so in a way, like even when I'm working by myself, I'm kind of collaborating um, because I'm sort of teaming up with 
the technology or the material that I'm working with. So I'm, I'm never just kind of like sitting down and making something from scratch as I envision it. Like there's always this play going on and like some element of randomness. So, but I particularly do like collaborating with other humans um, because they always bring a really cool perspective. Often they'll be, you know, if it's from a different discipline, they're coming from a completely different angle of how they view space and time. Like it's just a totally different way to um, approach a composition. Um, and then even when I'm working with other visual artists, like um, Ben K. Foley is another Somerville artist. We did the Infinity Box um, video. He kind of comes at things from like a more like in, a, in this like weird way that's not going to make total sense, like a structural way, but also like more metaphysical where he plays a lot with like illusions of perception and kind of does what he considers like kind of like brain hacking where you're sort of able to create illusions through physical pieces, whereas I... I'm sort of creating dimension and illusion through imagery. Um, and so being able to pair up when he kind of creates structures and then has like some crazy way to project um, my art in it. Like we're doing something, he was doing something in the, when it was snowing, we're just like projecting onto the snow and fog that was like super cool. So um, just uh, having my mind opened to um, new ways of performing and new topics, new techniques. It just sort of like busts open the door to so much more possibility. Um, so that's why I like collaborating. Um, yeah, uh, feel free. Do you have anything to say about collaboration, Angie? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think of the work that's been shown here, mine, mine is a little bit, um, lone wolf. Um, so I, I haven't been as much on like the, I've been the collaborator type end of things. Um, I have enjoyed a bunch of projects um, in the past where I've either um, set up the collaborations or just like been among other artists. Um, and it's very cool in, in seeing um, how all the people's different just like the way that people's brains work differently is, is very cool to me. Um, something um, I've done a couple of times with friends is just have a prompt, um, usually like a piece of writing and have like five different artists of five different disciplines. By the way, I sound like I'm taking credit for this. This is all my friend, Julia, um, who, who originally organized the show um, that the first piece was in. Um, and just seeing how wildly differently people can respond to it. And that's always really neat for me. Awesome. Um, and while I have you, um, both um, you and Allison work a lot with uh, found footage and stock footage. Um, I guess, Angie, could you talk a little bit about why you do that or what, what you feel like you get out of it? Sure. Um, I think that's a really interesting question. So stock footage, I'm just drawn to because um, I think it's often really goofy. I don't know if that's like really snobby of me to say, but there are um, a lot of like cliches and tropes. Um, and I, I really enjoy that. Um, I, I think there's like a, a humor in it and, and I like um, working with it. Um, there's something also that's like really intriguing to me about like trying to reproduce it um, and knowing the amount of, I guess, like labor and work that could come into like producing something that like um, the amount of like precision, like lighting and things like that, that would be needed to take like a product photo that you like see in a second and just like dismiss it because it looks like everything else. Um, I think that's really interesting to me. Um, and also in contrast with a lot of the footage on my phone, which is just extremely crappy um, and how I can make those two things play with each other. Um, awesome. Yeah, I guess same, same question for you, Allison, in terms of why, why you find inspiration in found footage. Yeah, I think there's a little similarity. Like I, I sort of love the like kitschy novelty um like i i get what you're saying angelina about like the goofiness of like especially if it, it's created with one intention of like selling or like having some veneer of 
commercialism and especially when it's decades old it feels really foreign and you're like I'm not like that this is so cheesy like I wouldn't buy that um but there's also like all this richness of it being kind of like a time capsule um and you can notice things now that just seem so totally out of date or conversely are like still totally resonating and you're like whoa like there's still so much pollution um in terms of like just to reference the piece that was shown earlier um and uh I think also just kind of seeing what new spin you can put on it and how you can kind of reframe it. So what may seem really innocent of like, you know, I have a scene of like kids playing or going down a slide and then by applying these filters, it becomes kind of apocalyptic. So I think just um, just kind of challenging myself to create new meanings and new looks um, and kind of just like just the remix possibilities um, are really enticing in a way that like if I created my own footage from scratch I would come in with a certain point of view and I think it would be harder for me to kind of break out of that and be more imaginative um although I do work with like my own stuff sometimes but usually you don't see it at the end like when I play with my own stuff it's like too distorted but if I'm playing with found footage I'm trying to keep at least some semblance of it so that um yeah, just kind of like a remix as opposed to um, like a total dissolution. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, yeah, I guess still on the topic of inspiration, um, I have a question for Margaret in terms of, you mentioned um, sort of your interest in the intersection of science and dance. I'm kind of curious like how how that came about and what what you sort of feel like you you get out of that process sure um i think where it came from um probably was when i was in high school i got really interested in um the career of physical therapy and taking anatomy um and kind of dance uh, therapy um and so in college i studied dance kinesiology um, and uh, really wanted to understand the relationship between dance and science, but also just how that can uh, uh, be in my choreography um, and just kind of the physics of how we're doing things and how we're moving about and how we can push those boundaries um, while we're dancing. So a lot of my work um, in older years um, was about um, kind of acceleration and other kind of more just like concepts, like textbook concepts, kind of boring. Um, but then they've kind of more morphed into kind of more psychological. There was a piece I made recently, recently, four or five years ago on matter and mattering on like the noun and the verb. I really also enjoy wordplay and going from that and really investigating kind of like the big bang and where matter came from, but also the psychological of like how we matter and how we belong in that kind of um, psychological science, um, more of a soft science, but inter um, relating those and then playing with kind of movement off of that and how we could move through different states of matter and just like, how we belong and also just like liquids and solids and gases and changing that in the tempo of choreography. Um, yes, yeah. So <laughs> that's a little bit about what I do with science. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think sort of, yeah, sort of still on the topic of um, dance or performance um, maybe we'll start with you, Margaret. I'm, I'm kind of curious how you see the, maybe the, the difference or the play between performance versus documentation versus sort of creating a, a polished video. And, you know, especially during COVID where it's so hard to do performances, um, you know, or what you were doing before COVID or, you know, what you think you're going to be doing a year from now. Um, 
Yeah, if yeah, if you could comment on sort of how you see your performance versus you know documentation of your performance versus creating new videos, you know, with dance. Sure, um, all of those. Um, I think for me, when I create um, video, um, it falls in between uh, documentation and then kind of normally the dance videos that I create. Um, tools for my choreography for the stage and they kind of turn into their own little dance videos in themselves kind of what happened a little bit with this project even though it was supposed to turn into a dance film but that chunk in the middle of the uh, continuous kind of linear sections is just kind of a documentation and not something totally um, planned out <laughs> on camera um, uh, I think now during COVID, um, people are doing more of making dance films and intentionally setting up the shots and doing um, kind of storyboarding and, but also still with their phones because nobody has really access to professional equipment right now or stage or anything, just kind of throwing it together. Um, and I feel like there's less of documentation happening right now, but that could just be me. Um, but I, or maybe people are just doing it for themselves um, because nobody really has a outlet for a performance necessarily besides more of dance films, venues or festivals, which there are a lot more of right now, but they're all virtual. And we all know how many virtual events we can go to. <laughs> uh, in the future, I think uh, dance film and dance and tech is still gonna be a very big thing. I hope that we can go back to live performance still and enjoy being in a theater and being present for the dancers um, rather than having this kind of um, ability to perfect um, what you're presenting through film um, uh, and have that kind of ephemerality of stage and live work. But I don't know if we're gonna be able to do that in a year from now, just with safety and everything just where we're gonna go back to it, but I really do hope for and look forward to that. And definitely my practice always incorporates videos. I've been working with video for 17 years, so that's not something I'm gonna let go of, but um, definitely wanna go back to also in person, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't know if Allison or Angie, um, you have any comments on performance? I don't know if either of you uh, perform any of your works. I don't really have anything intelligent to say about performance. <laughs> uh, right before the pandemic, I was like gearing up to do more like live video art combined with live music. And that obviously is now taking a back seat. But um, so I hope that, that opportunity comes along again. I really like the idea of um, I mean, there is something to like creating work and then just putting it out there and hoping people like it. Um, but there's something that's kind of more immediate and um, more of a rush, I guess, like being in the place where people are seeing it as it's happening um, and kind of being a part of like the thrill of that um, and creating an experience where there's a more of an interpersonal connection. So, um, yes, I definitely hope that comes back. In the meantime, I'll just keep cranking out stuff and hopefully upping my skills. So when it's time to go be live, I'll be all the more professional, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of your process or techniques or technology, like what is, what is uh, being live like mean to you? Like, what does that look like? So that's something that I'm still figuring out because there is kind of like this lag time in terms of like I'll go like for every clip you see of mine there may be like 20 other takes of it where I'm just like trying it out maybe I'm like slowing it down or amping up some kind of element to it or distorting it further so I sort of need to figure out how that's going to work that's a great question to which I don't have a definitive answer but um, so stay tuned and you'll you'll find out if you come to one of these performances. But um, I do want to figure out some way, whether it's like 
having some stuff queued up, but maybe I would love to have it um, in some way, like rhythmically synced to um, the music that's playing. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Cause right now, like I generate all my stuff on my phone and then I like feed it into my computer to do like real editing. Um, so I don't know if it would be a combination of that or if it would just be my laptop and I would just kind of be like VJ style. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Um, I guess, uh, on a different topic, um, I think, um, Angie and, um, Allison are both graphic designers. I think that's, is that correct? <laughs> um, um, I guess I'm wondering, uh, maybe Angie first, um, how do you feel your graphic design and brand work um, informs your art and vice versa, you know, if, if it does? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I wouldn't say very directly. Um, so I work at, at Tulip. We make software for manufacturers. So the space is very technical and very engineering-y. Um, I moved to the area for the job straight into MIT land. And it was a really huge disconnect for me at first. Um, but it's it's gotten me kind of like indirectly, indirectly plugged in. Um, there's this um, meetup group or Google group, I'm not really sure, um, called Tech Poetics that I started attending. Um, I think my work generally, I would describe as like pretty lo-fi, um, but it's definitely gotten me thinking about how these things can fit together in unexpected ways. So not very, not very a direct correlation, but definitely expanding my horizons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I guess, yeah, the same, same question for you, Allison. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, I, it's funny, I, that had never crossed my mind to think about I've always just kind of like siloed, but it's my art is definitely like bleeding over through different disciplines. Um, in terms of graphic design, I think I kind of take that eye for like composition and tone and like flow and look and feel. But at the same time, my art is very, I wouldn't say it's like anti-design, but I mean, like there is no white space, <laughs> like there's like no breathing room. So I wouldn't translate my art directly to graphic design it would just be like total sensory overload but I think that's also partly why I like it because I'm able to just kind of like break down any walls and just like go crazy um but I think it's also now that I kind of think about it, it's even like more holistic than that like I have a background in writing um some dance some music so I think it all kind of comes together in terms of like how I try to make sure there's like movement and flow and like synchronicity with like rhythm or dynamics of music. Um, and like, even if my work is like the more abstract stuff and doesn't have like a specific meaning, there's some narrative that at least makes sense to me as I'm making it and watching it. So, um, so I think it all kind of ties together, even if it's not immediately apparent, or even if what I'm doing is in like, direct contrast to what another I'd be doing in another discipline there's like some at least in my own mind like a uh, frame of reference for it even if I'm just like totally blowing it up mm -hmm. yep definitely um I guess maybe a, a similar question um for um for maybe Margaret and Allison um I know I know Allison, you teach and run workshops. Um, I think I think you do as well, Margaret. Um, some some bit of teaching. Uh, I guess yeah. I'm, I'm wondering sort of how. Yeah, what what interests you in teaching, and like kind of the same question, like how does it how does it inform your art, um, you know, or does it? Um, how does it relate to your practice? Um, so yeah, maybe Margaret first, if you had any comments on that or sure. mentorship even. Yeah. Um, so I do a lot of, uh, most of my classes 
our um, ballet technique or choreography. Um, but my ballet um, classes normally kind of strip away the whole like eight counts and kind of um, I'm trying to fool you a little bit. Um, not in like intentionally, um, but we're playing a lot more with space and kind of getting out of the box of the normal ballet box um, and looking at the science of how our body works and how um, we listen to music and we do a lot with our eyes closed. So challenging our proprioception um, and kind of we get um, a lot of my classes, I have them construct a point shoe. I was working with somebody at MIT and her redesigning a point shoe. Um, so kind of getting them to think more about um, why we use the tools we do in dance. Um, and then choreography, just playing with space and who, um, who around us informs us and holds the shape of our bodies in kind of the physical sense of the environment and also the audience and that. And so kind of all of that informs what I do and what I create um, and it has the science, the collaboration and kind of the music part in it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, yeah, maybe the same, same question for Allison. Yeah, um, so I teach some workshops virtually and in person. Um, and then um, a lot of just like one on one mentorship kind of stuff, or just it's kind of collaborating kind of mentorship where so with all the glitch art stuff that I do, it's all it was all self taught. And I just kind of figured out as I go. And so when I meet other artists who are interested in digital art or interested in glitching, it's like, they shouldn't have to go through like, all that effort to figure stuff out if I can kind of like give them a like cheat sheet to be like okay try these out like I don't necessarily tell them how to make their art but like just kind of inform them about like what tools they might like or that are out there um so it's sort of just like opening up um the field to more people to have the opportunity to try it out um and sort of see like for me especially like we're getting into glitch art was really exciting for me because I've had creative instincts for however long, but I'm not like great at drawing or great at painting or any kind of like fine art or like manual art, but getting into the world of like digital art and design um, really opened up a lot of possibilities for me to express myself and to create and just feel good about it um, or connect with other artists. Um, or be part of really cool video projection uh, series in Union Square. So um, sort of democratizing um, those opportunities or just like that genre of um, art has been really gratifying. So I think that's a big thing. And then a lot of the people who I end up kind of like giving the bug to or they, they have the bug and I kind of nurture it, like we end up collaborating. Um, like I did a show um, at Emerson last year and I think it's gonna be traveling. It might go to Southern New Hampshire University um, in the fall, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and I've been able to kind of like pull, pull in a lot of other artists um, who I've collaborated with, like Alex Kittle is another Somerville artist where she makes pop culture illustrations and I animate them. Um, so uh, even if I'm not necessarily like teaching the specific techniques to other people, just being able to, it kind of is like just teaching other people how to play it, like what, that a game exists and how to play it and then we can play together. So um, so I view it that way where it's just like, instead of gatekeeping, it's like the opposite of gatekeeping, just like flinging the gate open and welcoming people in. Um, so yeah, especially because it's a little bit esoteric. Like I don't even know I don't really know how I would find out how to do it if I hadn't just figured it out myself. So I think the more that I can kind of include others and get them to explore on their own, but with some guidelines, um, so they feel reassured and supported and encouraged, um, that's sort of where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. um, great, yeah. And um, yeah, feel free to chime in, Andrew, if, Angie, if you wanted to speak at all towards sort of a mentorship or teaching? I was just gonna say, I wanna take your workshops, Allison. Cool, yeah. Uh, well, at the end, we'll give out our contact info, so then we'll be able to all 
interact. Definitely. Um, so I think um, we have about 11 minutes left. Um, so I figure I'll just open it up to um, the three of you, kind of whoever wants to respond. I'll, I'll throw out some questions or we can um, have a conversation. Um, and let's see, a question from Facebook. Yeah, so if you're on Facebook, feel free to um, ask a question. We might be able to get to it in the last um, 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, a question for Angie, are you on IG? I don't know what that means. Instagram? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't seen the... Uh... I am. Um, I, I don't post a lot of work work on there, but if you want to be my friend on Instagram, I always welcome that. Um, my handle is, I, I did not make this easy for anybody outside of the algorithm, but it's Angelina followed by, there are six Lenas total. So Angelina, Lena, 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 as many as will fit. You can find me. <laughs> um, I also, um, I just shared Hopefully your correct um, website URLs, so you all have a website. So um, maybe that's also a good way for people to follow you. Um, but yeah, does anyone else have any preference of how people can follow them like mailing list or Twitter, Instagram, et cetera? Yes, all of the above. Um, yeah, so if you go to my website so i'm glad you have this up because like spelling my name out can sometimes be troublesome um and you pronounce it exactly right so thank you um so my instagram and twitter handles are the same it's my first initial then tannen house so a tannen house um that is my website that you see there on the screen um and then from there there's a link like on the bottom for the newsletter though i haven't created it yet but it's going to be awesome so you should definitely sign up so when it comes out you can experience the majesty. Um, but I'd say I'm most active on Instagram. Um, I post a lot of just like random stuff as well as like promotion for the events like this. Um, so you can kind of stay in the loop um, as to like what's going on in the digital art community, at least from my perspective. And I, I do try to promote a lot of other artists as well um, and kind of boost up um, the general the general base. So um, that's what's up. Um, well, my website is great. And also my Instagram is just wiss.co. So W-I-S-S.co. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, I will, I'll stop sharing the screen. Um, yeah, I guess um, one, one question I have is um, what what projects are you working on now or are there any new projects you're excited about or um, things yeah you're hoping to start in uh, in the new year I have a new um, project that I'm starting um, right I've been trying to start it since last May and it just is happening now. Um, it's with six different international dancers um, based in, let's see, Switzerland, Paris, New York City, um, India, and Australia, and Boston, um, as myself. Um, and we're creating a performance that's kind of based around the moon. And we're using the moon kind of as our audience, um, as kind of like only the normal thing that we can all see together. and. We're trying to do a synchronous performance um, that is in person um, with safety protocols, um, hopefully in the summer. So I'm excited about that. Very exciting, Margaret. Uh -huh. I have been um, getting back into photography work lately. Um, so I really like making still life scenes where you can't tell if it's a photo or a render. 
um, maybe some, some similar themes to what we were talking about before. Um, but um, yeah, things that like look like they're an ad or a product placement, but there's also like a story that's being told around it. That's definitely wouldn't be the story that's being sold with the product. So um, one thing I'm excited to start trying is bring some motion into it as well. I've been some, a lot of artists who are bringing um, motion into like otherwise still images. Um, and I haven't tried that before. So if you follow me on Instagram, I can subject you to it there. I, I'm looking forward to what they're doing. Um, and uh, I'm working on some music videos coming up with um, local saxophonist Ken Field, uh, some more uh, videos with Doug Bielmeyer, um, and also uh, Square Root of Negative Two, which has a local artist as well, Robin Amos and Blake Ripton, who's over in Malden. So keeping it kind of contained. Um, and then also I'm working on um, planning out a public art installation with Maria Finkelmeyer, who just did the, the hatch shell installation, um, Hatched, which was super cool. If you guys were able to see another like great winter projection event. Um, and I'm taking a telematics class that um, with a bunch of artists from all over the world where we're kind of learning different broadcasting systems and like basically how to make uh performances online um in collaborative ways um so that we don't feel quite so boxed in um so that we can continue in this time to create and share and inspire thanks um yeah i guess on that topic um if any of you have kind of anything um, not art related or uh, shout outs to other artists, um, feel free to um, bring that up or yeah, like a book you're reading that you're super interested in, um, if anyone can comment on that. If anyone's into cats, I make cat stickers. What's up? <laughs> My Etsy shop. It's sort of art related, but also just like cats related i know that uh mike just scored this is time for random stuff right so that's okay uh, i know mike just scored a film that is in south by southwest which is happening i think in a couple of weeks so if anyone wants to see that i think it's called trade center um yeah i just finished reading a really good book about the internet it's called nobody is talking about this that's my Shout out. Well, I want to give a shout out to the Brattled, which just celebrated its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit and uh, is still doing really awesome uh, programming, some really cool uh, the, like online uh, streaming and different um, group discussions and stuff like that. Um, so that's been a cool way to stay locally connected with arts and stuff like that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll end it here. <laughs> thanks. Thank you.